Welcome to Jung at Harp. I'm Kathleen Wiley, a Jungian psychoanalyst in North Carolina, and I'm here with Deborah Henson Conant, a composer, harpist, entertainer, mentor, coach. We both play the harp, and that's why we call our conversations Jung at Harp. Every week we come together with a question, not answers, but with a question. And we invite you into our dialogue and hopefully you'll be able to add some comments as we're talking and we can see them. Sometimes technology lets us do that. Sometimes it doesn't. But we do want your concepts concepts and um, comments before and after. And today we're going to talk about which impulse to follow. So, Deborah, do you want to start with how we got to this question today? <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of ways that we got to this question today. And one of them is that in the uh, concepts of creative resonance, which is at the heart of a lot of the work that I do, and there are seven strings of, I call them the seven strings of passion, but there are seven principles at, that lead from creative impulse to creative expression. And the first three concepts are impulse, structure, and character. And I have it that when we have a creative impulse, once it has a structure to follow, and when we can then bring in the character of who we are, we're already creating art. Mm -hmm. Then we can use the platform of an instrument or an art form, um, engaging with others, but we are already you know, we're already engaging in artistic, creative self-expression. Mm -hmm. If we have an impulse, a structure in which to share that impulse, and we are bringing who we are, our character to it. And so that was the first part. That's sort of maybe the intellectual or the artistic part. And then I was also noticing something happened to me this week that in which I realized that a series of impulses of myself that I had led to a connection that I had with someone else that I never would have had before and that made a difference in someone else's life. And it was just so interesting to see how that happened. So I'll just sort of describe it. Um, I had told someone that I would be sending them a check. And then I forgot to ask my bookkeeper to write the check. And she used, she writes the checks on Wednesday. It was Friday. It was the freezingest cold day that, that had been. And I was like, but I need to get that check in the mail. And, and the post office is, you know, a, a walk away. So I put on my snowsuit. And because I had my snowsuit on, I had to wear a pair of boots that I don't normally wear. It's this big, huge, you know, big open calf boots. And because I've had trouble keeping my socks together lately, I have this new <laughs> system of when I take my socks off and put them on, I have safety pins on them. So I go off and I'm walking to the post office in my snowsuit with these big boots <laughs> on and, and the, the pin from the sock starts hurting my ankle, but I can't stop because it's freezing cold. I get into the post office. I give my, the check over. And as I'm about to leave, the woman at the counter says, um, stay warm out there. And I, and I remember, aha, I have to fix my sock right now, take off the boot to fix the sock. And she says, oh, wow, those are great boots. And they have a really big calf, which I always have trouble finding. Um, and I said, well, I spend a long time looking for these boots and they're amazingly comfortable. And if you text me when I get home, I will text you how to get them. And I really had had a hard time finding these boots and they're amazing. So I realized as I was walking home, I was like, wow, this was a situation in which I became this magical thing for this person. I became what she needed and it was no problem for me but i was I like followed back all the impulses and i was like wow i forgot to send the check i could have just been like yeah no i'll wait till it's not freezing cold but i was like no that was my commitment was to get that check out so i'm going to do this and i'm and because of that i'm going to so if i hadn't forgotten to send the check if i if it hadn't been so cold if i hadn't had these extra boots sitting there if i hadn't been putting my sock together that way if she hadn't said and all of that led to this moment. So it made me think about many things, about impulse, about follow through, about how our following through on our own impulses and how it makes us show up for others mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. not as a way of like, oh, I'm going to show up for you because blah, 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 blah. But no, as we show up for ourselves and show up in the world and make ourselves visible, it starts, it opens up to other people. Right. Right. And, and it seemed magical and wonderful. And of course it felt great. And she's going to send me a picture, you know, she has the boots. <laughs> So, so that's, and then I realized as we were talking, um, putting, putting this life experience together with creativity that when, and and you asked the question, which impulse to follow? And I realized that, so there, I had many impulses. One of the impulses was like, yeah, it's freezing cold. I don't want to do this. But once we have a structure in place, especially if it is in I'm going to say in service of an, of a, of a vision or an idea. So I had a vision that he was going to get this check. He, the check was going to be in his hand on Monday. And um, then, then as we, th- that helps us know what impulse to follow. And that is true in, in creativity as well as in life. Yes. When we have that vision, I hadn't even thought about that, but the vi- when we have the vision, we have the impulse, the structure in which to do it, and then we bring who we are into that, and and we follow and we follow the impulses that keep leading in the same direction. Mm-hmm. That leads to artistry, and I think it leads to connection in life. But I just made that up now, so I it's not like I live by this. So I want to know what you think. Yeah, you know, I I think you're right. I think it does lead to life. There's there's so many things going through my mind that have bubbled up for me as you're talking. One is is that um, Jung says that the unrelated human being lacks wholeness and that wholeness is a product of the synthesis of I and you. And I don't mean one person with another, but I mean everything I have projected onto you that I then take back and see in myself because of my relationship to you. And so we we need each other in our move toward wholeness. And, you know, as artists, as harpists, musicians, psychoanalysts, composers, we want to bring our whole self. When you talk about bringing the character of yourself to a musical project, I always equate what you're saying is bring your whole self. Don't just be one little persona or one particular face, but let your whole self show up and inform what you're doing. And at the same time, sometimes we do have to pick which face we're going to show in this moment in time. Well, yeah, Um, because it's not (laughs) not necessarily so easy. It's easy to say, bring your whole self, but actually doing it, especially in the face of fears that are that are that are there to protect us. And also, um, I mean, I want to hear more of what you're saying, but as you were talking, it was reminding me of the moment in which my life, in which I thought, okay, I could either be a great harpist Mm. or I could be me. I could either, uh, so that someone would say like, get me a good harpist. I like, well, Deborah Hanson Conan is a good harp. No, uh, get me Deborah Hanson Conan. How do I make that shift? Right. Right. Yeah, that you re- you got it that the impulse to be you would give you the structure to express whatever character was appropriate for yes. you in the moment. Yes, well, although it was again not so a, a great easy to say and and uh, Right. Yep. So, and how do we do that? How, because there are so many impulses. I mean, <laughs> how do we create a structure in which we are able to really bring ourselves? And I loved what you said about, you know, me and you, the mm-hmm. meanness of things and the you-ness of things and being able to see the reflections within those. Yeah. So one of the things that bubbled up for me also, as you were talking about impulse structure and character in relationship of the strings of passion is I was thinking about how I was thinking about impulses and passion and that and the and then my mind went on to that wherever we have a passion oh I mean a not a fleeting impulse of desire that we sometimes call passion but where we have a passion that's pervasive in our body mind in our imagination then there's almost always a vision 
Those two things go together. That deepest passion, the deepest impulse of, of who we are corresponds to a vision. When we have something we want to express from our heart and share with the world, there's almost always a vision. Now, we might not have the exact vision pinned down, but images come some sense of what that would look like. So I think a part of how do we decide which impulse to follow is we have to begin to ask ourselves, is this a fleeting impulse? Is this like a third degree impulse, third gates removed from my heart and soul? Or is this an impulse that's at the first gate of my heart and soul? You know, it's like, how close in is this? I, I was having this conversation with a colleague of mine um, sometime in the last month, because I I, I'm just working too much right now professionally, and I love my work and the, all the things that I'm doing, I enjoy, they feel meaningful, they fit with my overall um, my overall purpose of making a difference and empowering people to know God within them, to know who they really are. And my colleague said to me, and before he became a Jungian analyst, he was in the finance world, he said, your vision is too broad. You've got to narrow it down. Where is it? What groups, what audiences is it that it's most important for you to do that in? And he began in a very um, loving way to say, you know, yes, it all fits, but that just means the fact you're overwhelmed with it is your vision's too big. You've got to narrow that. And it's a paradox because the Western mystery tradition says it is within right limitation that we really attain to our largesse. You know, our culture doesn't like to acknowledge limits. But if we go back to impulse character, impulse structure and character to, to create a musical a piece of music or to have an interaction with someone else or to schedule your, make your schedule for the day. One has to take that impulse, whether it's my impulse to have the conversation with you, my impulse to get to the gym, my impulse to have harp time. I had harp time this morning at 530. <laughs> yeah. I don't let myself follow that impulse very often. It was so, so satisfying. Um, I'm usually pushing that impulse aside to for other impulses, you know, things I should get done. So that was a side note. But somehow we have to look at what where does this impulse fit in the overall passionate vision of who I am? Part of my passionate vision right now is to have more balance. So which impulse to follow this morning? I've gotten to the gym early a couple of mornings this week. I've done some of the intellectual prep work I needed to do some this week. So this morning, it was like the impulse for balancing is I'm going to go to my harp, you know? Yeah. You know, it's really interesting as you're talking about this, I've written down, uh, you know, when we first started talking, I was like, how, how could I have created the whole strings of passion without vision, without, without vision being in there since it's such a huge, and then I realized <laughs> I wrote down here, impulse is vision. And then I just realized vision is structure. And, and then, and then as you were, as, as you were about to say, it's a paradox, I thought you were going to say it's a parable. And, um, and so I'm thinking about all of this because I'm thinking about the golden cage. So this is a musical. It's a story that I started writing when I was 19 based on the question asking, it wasn't like the teacher gave me this question. I was asking myself, am I going to have a life of freedom or a life of security? What's, what's where I'm, what am I going to reach for in this life? And immediately it became two characters, one on the inside of a cage, one on the outside of a cage. And those two characters began speaking to each other. So fast forward, you know, 50 years and, and that, that story is finally coming out into mm -hmm. the world and I'm seeing it as as revealed by two amazing actors an amazing director stage designer you know costumes I'm seeing it fleshed out and I'm seeing that I've kind of lived anyway I'm seeing the structure reflected back to me and realizing that a story is a structure that in that holds impulse character and it's a structure that holds impulse and character um and and that reveals the answer i mean 
it, it, the answer to that question, as it turns out, is not one or the other. The answer to that question is, hello, that is life. And, and this story as played out, you know, lets me look at life in that way. But, yeah. but what, what am I saying here is that when we have a vision, um, it can hold us to a more flexible set of actions that we may take towards it. Like I had no idea that all the time that I was leaving that vision or felt that I was abandoning that vision, that in fact, I was actually bringing myself to it, finding out more about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And so, and so everything that I did simply enriched and enriched and enriched that story and the meaning of the story. So where, what am I getting at here? Um, the, all the things that I wrote down were restriction versus limitation. Um, you know, that, that limitation does open up possibility because it, because it's true. We can have too many impulses. Mm -hmm. now, now my brain is like, I remember when somebody said, well, I do remember years ago, um, my boyfriend in, in college who was in medical school pointed out to me that my ability to do this is not because my ability to do this is because I am able to control not doing this left without. And I can't remember how he said it to me, but mm -hmm. it, it really stuck with me that the power of being able to do this is that it's not this, mm -hmm. it is actually focused. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, Kathleen, help. What am I saying? <laughs> well, so I want to circle back to kind of what you started with, which is, I'm playing with how the strings of passion, we might also call the strings of vision. And that if we look at some of the esoteric spiritual teachings, and I'm thinking about the tree of life, which is a glyph of, it's said to be a glyph of the energies of the divine that came into the soul of the world and the soul of humanity at the time of creation. There are 10 spears or energy centers on the tree. And there are pairs that balance each other and the desire nature and the intellect balance each other. And, and in order to, to truly embody and manifest the essence we are, those two things have to work together. So in a way, if we rename strings of passion to strings of passionate vision or strings of vision, impassioned vision, then it really does acknowledge what I think you're feeling, which is and all seven of those strings, there is vision that emerges. And maybe really the strings of passion are a way to find, to access consciously a vision that truly is the expression of that which is deepest within one that one is wanting to share at that moment. So I, I, I'm just thinking about how they're intertwined. I don't really think we can separate them out. And I think that's part of what you were feeling when you were saying, yeah, passion, you know, vision is an impulse. Vision is in structure. Vision is in character. Vision is in the roles. I mean, if we kept on going down. Right. Uh, but um, I, I'm always really struck by like, okay, wait a second. Vision is based on a specific sense that not everybody has <laughs> and that people have. So what is it? Yeah. Because it's clearly not like if I have, a, right. sometimes the vision is seemingly visual, but, but but sometimes it's not right. I mean, clearly, like when I when I had the vision of the golden cage and these two characters were there, it was it was more a felt vision. It's yes. not like I, I I mean, I knew I knew that one was on the outside of a cage. I knew that one was on the inside of a cage. I knew that that cage was in some remote location. Um, but that was all a felt vision. Right. Right. And I could almost locate in my body where that was felt. Yeah. So, so what is vision as and I, I feel like there's probably someone out there who, who, who studies this and they're like, oh, you people, it's this. <laughs> well, but I'm, I think you're you're raising a really important consideration to our conversation is that 
the way that I'm using the term vision and we're talking about it is far more than physical sight. And it's far more than the inner capacity to see a series of pictures, but it is vision that actually is informed by all of the senses and not just the physical senses, but what Rudolf Steiner called the inner senses, the spiritual senses. And for anyone who wants to know about those, there's a book entitled 12 senses by Sossaman, S-O-S-E-M-A-N. I'm not going to try to tell you all 12 right now because I don't have my little cheat note card in front of me. But he makes the point that that we not only have the five physical senses, i.e. I can touch this, but then when I physically touch it, this is my stand-up mouse, there is also a quality I feel in my body that's not tangible. So we are talking, and I think every creative knows this. Every artist knows this. And the and when I say creative, the creative artist you are may be in the kitchen cooking things up from scratch. You know, it may be the gardener you are that you go out and you see a plot of land and you just have this sense of, oh, this flower would work great there and this would work best there. It's something that is, is informed by all of those physical, literal senses and the energetic senses. And, and it is an intuitive process. And it is a body based process. And I'm going to cite now, Annie Murphy Paul, who is a science writer, in her book, The Extended Mind, says that the people who are more aware of what's going on in their body, make better use of unconscious information. So science, the world of science now is showing that there's something unconscious, i.e. we can't register it consciously, cognitively, i.e. through the physical outer world. But there's this all this intelligence and information we get that's unconscious, that's below, underneath our conscious awareness, that's constantly informing us. And that the more we are tuned into the subtleties of what's happening in our body, like what you were giving expression to at 19 vis-a-vis the writing of the golden cage and those two characters, um, then the more we are actually engaging with the deeper impulses, I'm going to say, of our true nature. So much bubbled up as you were talking about that, as you were talking about someone going into a garden and, you know, having their impulse. And uh, I, I had this sudden heartbreak as I thought about um, people going for impulse and moments when I've gone for impulse, when it didn't come out the way that we envisioned it, and when others around us assessed and uh, assessed and um, and and gave voice to their assessment, and and I'm I'm thinking about that because one of the most I've heard many times lately people have talked about the Hip Hop Academy, which is where mm -hmm. we're working for people to to find ways to actually take their imp creative impulses mm -hmm. and use the harp as a platform for those as the the real character and it it, it is it it is true that when that impulse first comes out in creative form it often just looks like what and yeah. and and it has to but it but it but it has to be combined with the body in some awkward weird way right. and and our own inhibitions make it like you know i think i'm going to go Wah! and i come out like Whoa! <laughs> like that and and so many of us are squelched in mm -hmm. that moment of creative impulse embodied and shared. And, and, and so sometimes the impulse, our question today is which impulse to follow. And so often that we don't know where there is a safe place. Mm -hmm. where 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 what we are trying to do will be seen and nurtured versus how what we did appeared in the world being assessed and judged and criticized and someone coming along and trying to fix it yeah 
Yeah. And what you're saying is so true about just being who we are in relationships and how we move through the world, you know, our impulse to, to say what we think, to share what we feel, to have an opinion gets squelched. We get afraid. If we do that, we'll be rejected. We'll be scolded. We'll say the wrong thing. You know, we'll be abandoned or whatever. So it, it's so very true. You know, I, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking developmentally for a minute <laughs> and how, uh, you know, around one, around two years old, we all have to learn that the impulse to poop gets best done in a in a specific place. And you know, it's it's a learning process, something that's a very natural impulse. Um, we have to kind of learn where is it safe to do that. Where is it that is socially acceptable? Where is it that? it fits. I mean, we don't want to, and, and even animals. I mean, I'm thinking about my little dog. She doesn't just go out and poop anywhere. She has specific spots. I mean, it's, you know, there's, so there's something of the animal nature that also wants that contained. I mean, I'm thinking about how birds will keep the nest cleaned up uh, at the mother bird keeps the nest clean. Now you all are thinking, why am I talking about this on something public? But we can't, if we go back to underneath what you're saying is where we've all been shamed because of our impulse and that developmental stage of having our autonomy and following our impulse, having self-expression, it's tied to the, to shame. And that mm-hmm. stage of development and relationship to others happens around two to four, where it's, developmentally in terms of our physical being, we're looking at how do we go to the, how and where, (laughs) and how do we, how do we have a structure for that, that, um, that works. And so (laughs) I'm laughing at that, that my mind went there and I actually talked about it on air, but I think that it is important for us to have, to have a presence with ourselves. The, the worst shame that happens is where we keep shaming ourselves. And, you know, self-hate is prolific. I see it all the time, every day with the people I work with. And I have over the decades had my own journey of dealing with that part of me that shames me, that judges me harshly, that puts me down. And I think about my own playing with the harp. I think I shame myself far more than anybody I ever play with because I go into, well, I don't know this tech. I'm not, and it's not even cognitive. It's not even like I'm saying those things, but it's that feeling of in my body that if I just go and play who, as I am today, where I am today, that somehow it won't be enough. It'll be less than I'll be bad. There's the shame. And so I have to really deal with my own mechanisms of self-hate my own judge, my own, you know, all of that. And so um, when we talk about impulse and what impulse to follow, I went back to potty, potty, pooping, because Uh we do have to learn where is, where do we, what's this impulse about? Where do I want to follow it to? And where is it safe? And we have to not shame ourselves for things that are natural. So when I can sit down at the harp and just let myself improvise and play around and I hit the quote discordant chord and I can think, huh, and I can really feel the sound of it and be curious about it. That's a totally different experience. than if I hit it and I judge myself. You know, this is really interesting because we, we, that, that it's kind of vert, uh, on this going over into shame. And um, so, so we've got a really beautiful comment and I want to read read this yeah. um, um, from, from Riam who says, how to bring together the concept of vision, which keeps one's mind in the future or on something that, you know, isn't there quote yet, but is, and the spiritual concept of being in the present moment where past and future disappear. Mm. And then they asked, perhaps the importance of having a vision is overrated. And I don't know that I want to answer that question right now, but I, as you were talking, Kathleen, so you were talking about shame and I was reading what Riam was saying about the concept of vision, keeping us holding the future and the spiritual Mm -hmm. present. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I suddenly thought, wow, is shame a kind of visioning? 
because vision seems to be an embodied, it's both visual, mm. but it's also embodied, you know, a vision that pulls us forward into mm -hmm. creation. And it almost seems like shame is a kind of visioning. And I don't know why, but I thought about a sebaceous cyst that has gotten bad, gone bad. But, but I, because a sebaceous cyst is where, you know, something is clogged off, it can't be expressed, it's, it's, right. it's building up inside. And then at a certain point, it gets infected. And it feels like shame has that same, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know why, whatever, um, that there's yes. this, this this transformation of something into something dark and brooding and, um, right. and painful. And at the other side is the, the 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 vision which pulls us forward has a very similar similar quality in that often it seems like it's very clear like the shame seems like it's clear but you sometimes can't pinpoint you can say well it came from this 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 that but the shame itself is much more compelling the vision, the creative vision is also much more compelling. It can hold you. This vision of the golden cage held me for years and right. decades and pulled me forward, just like shame has been in my life. Decades pulling me back, lusting after, yeah. you know, self-hatred basically. Yeah. So yeah. lusting and lusting, yeah. I mean, in the sense that it's a, it, it's a, it's a desire that's beyond that, that, that's just like so compelling and, right. and full of stars and light and whatever it is um, after a vision and lusting after self hate. And, and we only have two more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you know, um, I'm thinking about Reem's question and, you know, maybe that could even be our topic for next week, but I, I want to say this. I think it is important for us to further define what we mean by vision as we're using it, mm -hmm. because clearly there are some visions that take people very much out of the moment, even out of their body to the point that they do damage to their health. And then there are visions that are um, more uh, effusive. They're more, I mean, part of what I'm hearing about the golden cage for you, Deborah, is that it was actually it, it became a symbol. And Jung says a symbol is the best expression of that which is yet dimly discerned, that we don't really know all of what's in it. But the symbol pulls us forward. It's like a light. And maybe this is the kind of vision that I would want us to end on today is that we're not talking about a vision that's right brain, Western orchestrated. It's going to be this, 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 and look just like this. And we get caught in it because that so takes us out of the now, but it is this vision. That's more like a symbol that is like this light that we're moving towards. And the whole time we're already in the light and we know it. And think about a sun's ray. Um, and, and sometimes at night when I see the full moon on the water and I see that moon river, I just feel myself, I'm in the light of the moon on that river. So there's no separation between the vision as symbol that's pulling us forward and the now. It's all one and the same. And that's what I'm hearing the golden cage was for you. And I think when my friend and colleague said, you need to narrow your vision, your vision's too broad. What he was saying to me is you've got, you've got to get out of the diffuse of the light this big, more to the concentrated center of the light, where there's more power, as we know from the laser point. Yeah, and you're making me think of just one little thing, something, you know, riding on a moonbeam to be able yeah. to ride, to be able to have that that single right. thing that we can ride in on. Well, this just show this is why we've wanted to have these conversations ever since we first met. And um, this one leads to the next. And I just want to, Kathleen, thank you. This was so beautiful. And Riam, thank you. And the other people who have been watching while we've been here and also who will watch afterwards and, and bring comments. Thank you for this conversation. Yeah. And, and all that it's opened up and, and led me to today. And I cannot wait to see you again next week, Kathleen mm -hmm. and everybody else. Thank you for joining us in the beauty 
of conversation that we that where there's a question and no answer um, and we get to ride on that and find so many different answers thank you kathleen and thank you everybody we'll see you next week oh